All right, thank you so much all, for all staying here and being here. I know it's the end of the day, but I am so excited to see all your beautiful faces here because I've actually wanted to come to Israel like all of my life. I think Bruce mentioned I'm part Israeli, so I'm just so stoked to be here. So it's not just me on the stage. It's also like six-year-old Sarah on the stage, just super excited. Um, I'm also really excited because I get to talk about one of my favorite things in the world, which is animating view. Um, so I'm just super excited to be here. Also, um, Bruce is doing a wonderful job and emceeing today, so why don't we give him a round of applause. Yeah, it's, just, it's not easy going through all of those like t rough times we had back in Egypt and stuff. Uh, <laughs> um, so as I mentioned before, my name is Sarah Drasner. I go by Sarah Edo on Twitter, and this is me picking my nose as a child and my poor mother, and also my relationship with authority. Um, I used to be a consultant, which does not mean that I was unemployed. Um, I worked with all of these wonderful people, um, but I recently took a position with Microsoft as a senior cloud developer advocate, um, which I'm really excited about, and we're going to talk about some of those technologies today. Okay, so before we dig into all the ways to animate with Vue, it's really important that we talk about why we want to animate at all. In regular life, We've evolved to perform actions that flow more or less seamlessly. We wa aren't wired to deal with the fits and starts of human-computer interaction. I really love this quote from Tammy Everett's, and it's true. I walked onto the stage, right? I didn't just like pop up onto the stage out of nowhere. We're, you know, expected evolutionarily to notice something that transitions into our view. Our occipital lobe only really works in a hundred millisecond bursts. So, it, you know, to illustrate this concept. If something pops up out of nowhere, it's usually a bad sign. Um, it's usually something that's not super good for us. Um, and you'll feel like that on the computer, too. Anytime, you know, you might have encountered something like this where you're, you know, going to a site and before you even do anything on it, this modal pops up in your face. And you're kind of like asked to be given your information. You're like, I'm not even sure I'm in enjoying this site yet, like, buy me a drink first, come on. Um, if, you if you think I'm being picky, know that Google agrees and will now drop your SEO if you use a timed interstitial on mobile. So this is an anti-pattern. So here's an example of how we can gain spatial understanding on the web. This is an example from Code Drops, where just choosing your seats at a movie theater, you'd be able to get a real understanding of what's going on, what the experience is like ahead of you. You're also seamlessly transitioned from one state to another. So without transitions, we lose an opportunity. Things feel a little more clunky. They don't feel as fluid. And we, as users, have to have, are incurring a cognitive load because we have to mentally remap all of that space. In Paul Bacchus's Illusion of Speed, which is a great um, post, he addresses some studies that show that a lot of small movements in short activity are perceived as really long because of the cognitive load that it imposes, whereas the same actions that are um, in one fluid movement are seen as short. So to show you what I mean by that, I made this pen where you can see this marker opens up into a contact form. And that contact turns into the H1 for that, and then we can put in our email, and the email and submit inputs then become the loaders, which in turn become the success. And if I close that up and I ask you, where's the contact form? You'll say, it's in there. There's no in there. It's all just form elements and absolute positioning and animation. But we got one seamless experience for the cost of something that would usually be multiple modals in our face, and it feels a lot more fluid. So people ask me how to animate in Vue, but the amazing thing is that there's not just one way, so we'll cover a whole slew of them today. We're going to start off really simple, because I kind of assume that most people haven't worked with Vue, and then we're going to get to more and more complex implementations as the day goes on. Um, so the first thing we're going to talk about is the transition component. That's kind of like the basics of uh, animating in Vue. Then we're going to talk about the watchers and the reactivity system, because uh, Vue is a reactive framework. We're also going to talk about custom directives. We're going to talk about page transitions. And we're also going to talk about some data visualization uh, with 3.js. 
Okay, so we don't really have time to dig into everything that Vue has to offer, but just to show one of the many things that it does that speeds up development, I'm going to talk about a directive. Um, this Real, these kind of directives in Vue uh, can actually really speed up your workflow. And we don't have to do a lot of yak shaving. If you're not familiar with the term yak shaving, it's when you have to like go on a like, road to do a whole bunch of other tasks that aren't the task at hand in order to accomplish the task at hand. So we're not like, you know, redoing the same thing over and over again. So Vue cuts down on this work by offering good abstractions to things that developers commonly need. So in order to keep you productive, Vue shows a lot of simple ways to work with deeper functionality. So um, uh, directives are stolen from Angular, but they're kind of simplified in Vue. My, one of my favorites is vModel. It creates a relationship between the data and the instance and component and creates a form input so that you can dynamically update get values. And I'll, I'll show you what I mean. So here we're going to create a view instance and store a basic string in our data that we can allow the user to modify, uh, but we'll still be the owner of the state of it. If you've worked with React, this is very similar to get initial state. Um, the text area is just a normal semantic text area, except it has one difference. That V model directive is establishing a relationship with that message that you saw in the data earlier. Um, and it will output here in those mustache templates. So then when a user types things, we're automatically both allowing it to update, but also continuing to store and own anything that matters. This is pretty rad, because when you build out a large-scale application, this is, a lot of what we're doing is managing things in accordance with you know, user input. So you're not checking the DOM, you're not setting state, and it's all seamlessly updating in reaction to events. And in terms of animation, because that relationship was established with so much ease, it's incredibly simple to create advanced effects based on information we're given, like you see here. So you already know how half that demo works. We're going to go into how the other half works in a second. And that, along with the other abstractions offer, speeds up our development in like a super slick way. That's me in the car, like just jamming, yeah. <laughs> So let's dig into the transition component for a moment. Let's say you have a modal component that only shows based on a condition. It would show like this, which is easily done, but it's not great. It pops in your face. It, you know, we mentioned this before. Um, if you haven't worked with it before, here's what the transition component looks like. We wrap that conditional, and it's super easy to read and maintain. So it's going to manage our entrance and our exit. So here you have two ways of describing what's changing that we can hook into, so the enter and leave states. We have hooks for right before the event, like vEnter or vLeave. Uh, and then that vEnter active or vLeave active is where we're going to put all of our animation logic. So our transition plugs into that enter active class hook, and we can state just how we want that transition to work. So this is a transition, not an animation. So we're really just giving the browser instructions on how we want to interpolate things. So here's the base of what we need. It states the intermediary values, what should happen once it's done entering or leaving. And we don't need to declare the initial stages because it'll just use the default of what that component has. So here we have something a little bit better, a transition from one state to another rather than a Boolean. Great, but what would happen if we want that whole background to not take precedence? That's kind of a normal use case, right? Like usually we have a modal that comes up um, and we kind of want to obscure the background. So we could you know, wrap that whole background in a transition component, but that's kind of silly Then we're wrapping the entire thing in a transition component. Um, we just want it to lose focus a little bit. So um, we want to change out a few styles based on a condition. And luckily for us, Vue is really great at letting us make such a change with ease. So this is pr a pretty legible way of adjusting those classes based on a state transition. We use a simple ternary to state what it should be like before and after that transition occurs. And now we have classes that can hook, hook into and create some transitions. We can also use inline styles if we want to. The sky's the limits. Um, and so the amount of blur and opacity we're using, we're controlling that. So now we have something better with very minimal effort. It shows and hides the modal and blurs the background. And everything is based on components showing on a, com on a condition. So it's really reusable and very declarative. Aside from keeping those changes consistent and granular, there are nice pieces of sugar like transition modes, which I'm really a fan of. So what this will let, allow us to do is say, 
what if something is entering the DOM and something's leaving at the same time? Um, what usually happens is you end up having to like write a callback. So you have to be like, OK, as soon as that's done, then like give me this other thing and then make this other thing happen. Or if you're using CSS, you make these like delays between the two, and then you're updating that second, you know, the duration in two places. That's not so great. So what Vue allows you to do is state declaratively, wait for this other thing to finish exiting the DOM and then enter in, which especially when we talk about page transitions later becomes super useful. So this is a really good developer student uh, experience and makes it really intuitive. So we looked at this example a bit earlier. That, this is what I'm talking about, that moment that both of them are in the DOM at once, and it means that you can have awkward pauses in these visual inconsistencies. So I made this to kind of show, this is two elements, not one. But because I'm using a transition mode that fires immediately, it looks like one continuous thing. Without transition modes, we lose that opportunity. Both animations are firing on both elements at once. And it's not a huge thing, but in this instance, it kind of like doesn't look as great as it could. It doesn't look as fluid as it could. So, of the two modes, I, the one I always reach for is out in. That's probably the one that you want to use nine times out of 10. So we have a transition component. That's that transition mode. It just says mode out in. That's all you have to say in order to coordinate those things. Uh, so that lets us use this component really easily and with defaults, and we can omit it if we want to. OK. So we talked about transition, now let's talk about CSS animation. We'll still use that transition component, but we can now assign classes and, um, for those enter and leave states, and we can also reuse animations or plug into CSS animation libraries. Um, so we can have something like this, where we bounce the ball, and then we roll it out with two different uh, classes. And in this demo, you can see that I wrap that vif statement in the transition component, giving it an entrance and exit class. And then in bounces in CSS are a bit of a drag. You have to say it very imperatively what you want it to do. But with a mix in, we can improve this a bit. So now we get to some really cool stuff. JavaScript's really powerful for animation. So let's do some cool stuff with Vue and JavaScript hooks. So here we have some uh, custom naming for our hooks. Each part is available to us. And we can use as many of these or as few of these as we wish. We don't have to use all of these. We also state that the CSS is false so that uh, Vue isn't going and looking in our CSS for any of that animation logic. So this is probably the most basic example of what I typically use. I just have the enter and leave and the CSS is false. And now I can use all of that stuff in JavaScript and use request animation frame or use a library or what have you and have some really, really cool effects. So here's what my methods to use these hooks would look like. I have the enter. I'm passing in as params element and done. And then I can have all my animation logic in there. So in this demo, we can hook up vModel and animate the text onto our book in a really playful manner. I think I just say, I like tacos, so you don't have to see that. <laughs> Here we've got a transition component with before enter, enter, and a CSS false binding. So in the data, we have the default content. In before enter, we set the styles we want to accomplish the animation. So this is functionally equivalent to like writing these styles out in CSS. So people often ask me why I'm putting them in before enter rather than just putting them in the CSS. Well, the thing is, is that sometimes I'm maintaining a large application with a lot of people. And not everybody knows what these properties do. So if another developer comes along and sees these properties, which you, like actually make the animation totally change shape. Um, they don't do anything to that element before they start animating. So people like to delete code, and they'll be like, sweet, I can delete some code. This doesn't do anything and get rid of it. Um, so this kind of establishes a relationship like this is related to that enter animation. So that's kind of nice. Um, and then here we've got a for loop to just kind of scatter things around and plot them to a timeline in a kind of random manner. So this is a documentary photo, photo of me you know, working with those transition components. I get super down with them. I'm really, really excited. It's such a party. So now that we talked about the transition component, we can take just a second to look at the transition group component. component. That's a really fun one. 
So you might be familiar with FLIP technique for animation, and if you're not, that's okay, I'll explain it. Um, FLIP stands for First, Last, Invert, Play. And it's a really good way to make smooth animations on the web. So you saw in that uh, talk before mine that we need to use transforms in order to animate smoothly. So if you're animating two things, like one from here to there, what you need to do is you need to find the bounding client rect of each one of them and figure out what the difference is between those things are and then translate them to transforms to animate them appropriately. I can see all your faces like, oh my god, that's for a good reason. It's really like silly and not that fun to write. Um, so what's nice is that Vue allows us this thing called transition group, especially because, you know all that logic I just said? Imagine you have 100 elements. That is a really big bummer to calculate all of those things with 100 elements, but that's actually really when you need it. That's when that performance is really going to start to tank. So with Vue's transition group, I can wrap in uh, you know an element in those uh, in this component, and Vue takes care of all of the flip logic for me under the hood. So. Uh, here you can see we're making use of the v4 loop and we're making a lazy Sudoku. So this is from the guide. So you can just keep shuffling it over and over again until you win. Um, but you can see all of those things transition back and forth with like smooth, buttery animation. And it, we did very little to accomplish this. And so how would we use this in a real application? Well, with a combination of Vue's computed properties, which cache the logic, we can filter a lot of data and show the results in a really performant manner with two lines of code that would typically take hours to create. So, OK, we talked about the transition component. We talked about transition group. Now let's talk a little bit about that reactivity system, because reactivity is actually really great for things like animation. So the way we'll plug into the system is a thing called watchers. And in, for, in order for you to understand how watchers work, let's talk about reactivity in general first. Because I think there's some um, things that people often you know, are confused about with reactivity. So what is reactive? A lot of people, when I ask this question, will say RxJS. Well, you're not wrong. RxJS is indeed reactive, but reactive programming is actually a really big umbrella, and RxJS is one library that lives in that umbrella. So there are a lot of things that are actually reactive. Um, so how would I define that? Um, I think somebody defined it, maybe Andre Saltz. Um, reactive programming is programming with asynchronous data streams. Okay, Can we make that a little bit more legible for people who don't know what that is? Sure. Okay, A stream is a sequence of ongoing events ordered in time that offer some hooks with which to observe it. So I think the typical example that I hear people use a lot that I think is actually a really good one is an Excel document. You have a couple of cells, and then you want the sum of those two cells. So you say, I want the sum here. So then if you wanted to change the, the, you know, the values or the amounts in one of the earlier cells, you could do so, and it automatically updates. So Mike Bostock, who wrote D3, had a great quote where he said, um, asynchronous programming or reactive programming is wonderful because it allows you to program asynchronous programming as if it was synchronous. And I think that that's really true. When we use reactive premises for building applications, it means it's very easy to update state in reaction to events. So what is reactive in terms of all of these libraries and frameworks we're using? I just said not everything is RxJS. Um, Angular 1.x has dirty checking. Uh, Cycle and Angular 2 both use streams like Xstream and RxJS. Vue.js, Vue MobX, and Reactive all use a variation of getters and setters. And despite the name, React is not reactive. It, I know that's confusing. I was talking to Dan Avramoff, and I was like, wait, how do, and he's like, no, 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 no. It uses a pull approach rather than push. Sorry about the name. Um, so if you're curious about that, he actually pointed to me to some uh, really great pieces of that React design documentation. There's also uh, Vue's reactivity documentation and a great post by Damian Dulles. So if we represent the data that we want to check in data, again, you see that counter right there. That's that get initial state kind of thing. Um, we have a counter. We have a watcher on that property. So at, what that watch will allow us to do is just log anytime something is fired. Anytime something's changing, that watcher is going to allow us to have access to it. So if the state is similar enough, 
you can simply transition the state with watchers. And here I've built from scratch a chart with view with SVG, and as the data changes, the watchers will update and simply transition between them. SVG is really good for this because it's built with math. So if you pair SVG with uh, the directives in view, you don't even need a giant charting library. I wrote this, this is an axis. I wrote this with a few lines of code, and I can pull D3 out because I'm simply writing a full axis. And even like those bars, that's even more simple. So that's really, really nice. So in order to create the animation, first we'll create a dummy object that will be updated by our animation library. Then we have an update function that's invoked on every tween set. We'll use this to push the data. Then we create an object to hold the source data to be tweened in the function pointer for the update events. And in this for loop, we turn the current index into a string. And then we can tween over the, tar the target dummy object, but we'll only do that for the specific key. So we can also use the animation in Watchers to create something like this time difference dial. I work with a lot of coworkers all over the world, and you know we work in different time zones, so I wanted a way of different like visualizing where we all are so I'm not making meetings for people at 3 in the morning. And I also wanted an animation that kind of easily allows me to see if it's daytime or nighttime here. Um, so we're watching the checked property, and we'll fire different animations that change the hue and saturation and some other elements based on that relative association of time. I took the syntax highlighting out to test you. No, I'm just kidding. It just fell off. I don't know why. <laughs> Um, as a quick note, and Brian totally like ruined this for me, um, <laughs> you can take out big libraries like mo moment.js by using two locale time string. It's a native method, but I guess it's getting even better. So, you know, never mind. Um, <laughs> no, actually, this is a really, really useful method that's native and it is in browsers now, and you can still use it with like Edge and IE and stuff. So, if you don't want to use a big library like mo uh, moment.js, this will respect daylight savings time. So with Vue, we can also respond to synthetic events midstream, like I did with this ball bouncing that updates the radius and height of the ball while it's moving. I can just like steal physics from physics libraries and like use those in my animation as I do here. Um, and we don't even have to plug into watchers to leverage them to interpolate states either. Vue offers class and style bindings that lets us uh, connect user interaction to element styles. So you might have seen similar demos to this with CSS variables and JavaScript, but Vue allows like much wider support to IE and Edge browsers as well. So here in the instance, we start with x and y at 0 and tack the progress uh, with e client x and y, and then we can hook it up with our styles. And this is just using perspective origin. It's causing all of that to change. So uh, now we can talk about some ways to animate SVGs with Vue. It's really, really fun to uh, animate SVGs with Vue because SVGs offer, an, offer a navigable DOM, so we can attach all of those directives to S SVG as well. So let's take a look at this little Wally that I made from a dribble shot. Wally has a <laughs> looping animation for the way that he looks around and blinks, and then he's trying to follow his cockroach friend around. <laughs> um, so, uh, and another, you know, on another note, emotions <laughs> attached to your limbic system. So anytime you cause the user to feel an emotion, they're more likely to remember it later. So in the view template, we create a mouse move event in the HTML. And then in the methods in JavaScript, well, basically what I'm doing is I'm creating a looping animation of him like blinking and moving around. And then I have his arms extending like this on one animation timeline. So I'm allowing that e client x and that mouse move to scrub that animation timeline as you move across and then also flip him. OK, so so far, all of our animations have been coordinated in lockstep with each other um, in one small piece of animation. So let's do something like that's more application-wide. And for that, we'll use a thing called Vuex, which is similar to Redux, if you're familiar with Redux. Um, you can use Redux in Vue, actually. Um, but Vuex is Vue's version of it. So if you're using Vue already, you might want to just move over to, move over to Vuex. So, once we've encapsulated what's changing, each component owns its own state, like here. So 
So we can use, reuse these components, change their order, and manage their state in a really clean and simple manner. So in this example, I'm not even passing the state around. I create a centralized store with Buex, and in mutations, I can number these templates, toggle their visibility, and advance them. And then I'm going to have them loop back around to the first one. So this is inside of one SVG. We have different components based on the state of our store, each with their own entrance. And I'm actually attaching myself to lifecycle hooks here. So we have mounted, similar to component did mount in React. Um, so we have all of our animation uh, logic you know, coming in on that mounted hook. So if you're not familiar with lifecycle hooks, uh, lifecycle methods, this is you know, an example of them. There's a bunch that you can hook into, um, and that happens every single time you mount a component or unmount. So if you've never worked with a custom directive before, let's talk about those. We saw that V model directive. So one thing that I really like about Vue is that a lot of times when you're working with a, a library that offers abstractions, it's really great for a little while. And then you hit a wall because you come into this point in time where you're like, that abstraction doesn't cover my use case, and now I'm screwed. So um, if, if you use Vue, what's nice about it is because we're, um, we have this like reactivity system, they allow you lower level access into the reactivity system, but also to create custom directives. So anything that you're implementing again and again, you can create for yourself and actually you know, um, create some really, really nice logic that you can attach very easily. So let's see how we can use that for animation. So here's how we would create a custom view directive. It's probably most common to hook into bind. So we've created a custom directive called VTAC, but it's actually not that useful yet. It's just like doing position fixed. Um, so let's do one better. We can pass a value into the directive. It's a bit more flexible. We can tell the VTAC, uh, VTAC directive to stick this element to 70 pixels down from the top, and then we can kind of control the scroll from there. So let's pass in more than one value, and now we can really make this flexible and tack the element anywhere. OK, so let's apply this to animation. In this example, we'll create a directive that attaches to a scroll event, and it allows you to hook into that functionality and do some animation or something, and then it will remove the listener. So now we're cooking with gas. We can create and coordinate all of these sweet scrolling animations, anything that's triggered, triggered on scroll. And you'll notice I eliminated a giant library like scroll magic or like waypoints or anything like that, and all I have is the code you saw on the last slide. Seriously, it fits on a slide. Um, so we can create really cool interactions with, their page, uh, with our pages. So I make, made this with D3 in Vue, um, using a similar custom directive. And so you can see all of this like fireball data from NASA, and we can do some scrolly telling. So here we're just uh, using that custom directive, and we can update those circles based on fireball data that I got from NASA and you know, coordinate all of the visualizations on that page. So OK, now let's talk about page transitions. This one is super sweet, because usually making page transitions is a giant pain. Everybody's like, why can't we have native-like animations on the web? Well, using Vue, you actually can, uh, especially with Nuxt. So you might have heard people talk about server-side rendering of late. One particularly compelling aspect of server-side rendering is uh, the performance benefits. We're basically you know, calculating everything beforehand, and we're giving the HTML, CSS, and JavaScript as they live to the page. So this has been SEO benefits and performance benefits. I really like this quote. By rendering on the server, you can cache the final shape of your data. So if you don't already have Vue CLI installed, here's that command. We'll only run that once. And then once it's installed, anytime we want to spin up a project, we're just going to use Vue init, Nux starter, and then we can create a project. And what this allows us to do is have server-side rendering, code splitting, um, all of our pre-processing in one place, and we have all of our routing um, just from using Nuxt. All of these pages, if we want to create a page, we're just creating a view file in the pages directory. So we're creating routing without stepping outside of a view file ever. So here we just have a link from page to page, and you can already see that work. 
So Next is really amazing because you don't even have to wrap anything in a transition component or anything. It'll already assume that you want that, and it'll expose this transition component hook. So if you say page enter active, page leave active, that's all you need to do to create page transitions. You can just create page transitions with just a tiny amount of CSS, no setup at all. And usually that's really hard to coordinate, right? Like I feel like there's so many times I've tried to make page transitions and it has not gone well. Um, <laughs> and you don't just have to use transitions either. We can create animations as well. Don't do this to your app. I'm just messing around and trolling you. <laughs> Um, but we can also use JavaScript hooks like we had before. Remember, we had those sweet out in uh, the transition modes. That means that one page is going to go all the way out before entering in. So we have those available to us. We can use these hooks to create really beautiful things, and we can change them per page. So we're using you know, um, SVG and some animation here. And you can see each animation is going to change per page, too. They're not always going to be the same. And because we're using SVG as a side note, like uh, I think I show this in just a second, you can also create really, really stable things for responsive. So that only took a few lines of code too. So SVG is pretty awesome for making these kind of beautiful layouts and typography as well. So if you want to explore the repo and the demo, uh, those are both available to you. So the last thing we're going to talk about today, I know you're all tired, we're almost done. We're going to talk about how we can use serverless functions to create really interesting data visualizations in Vue. So personally, I think serverless is one of those really awesome things, but with like a really bad clickbaity title. Like the first thing that um, people will tell you is like, you're actually using a server. Like that's true, you're actually using a server. There's not serverless. So what do they mean by serverless? Um, the promise of serverless is that you're not babysitting a server. So you can actually create, just tell the thing what you want it to do, and it scales for you, and the pricing scales as well, so you're only paying for what you need. You're not babysitting that server at all. So it means it's also really good for small functions that you'd like to do. Maybe, you know, if you want to do a ton of logic with a server, probably stick to like a regular server. But serverless functions and, um, are like really, really useful for some of these calculations that we're going to do. That's why we call them functions as a service or FAST. So as I mentioned before, I work for Microsoft as a developer advocate, and people often ask me where my team is speaking and when. So there's tons of us, and I have like a list of all of where we're speaking, and we're able to filter through that list really quickly. And we also have this like data visualization for the globe. Um, so in the Azure portal, in order to create this, we can get some templates for automatically updating GitHub files. There's already a thing for that, and this is what it comes with. You can see that we're like running that function, and we can already see that it works. Status 200 OK. That's like the base template for it. So then here, we're going to retrieve geo. Uh, what we need is geolocation information for each one of those coordinates that we're going to. We just have their location. All we have is like San Francisco or Tel Aviv. Um, so we need to go get that geolocation information from Google. And for each item in the original data, not shown here, we'll, you know, we'll error if it doesn't go well. And then we, you know, given an array of entries wrapped in an iterator, we'll walk through each of them and populate the latitude and longitude with the Google Maps API. We'll also cache locations um, and save some API calls, and we'll check the cache to see if we've already looked up this location as well. So now we can just use this serverless function, and it's automatically updating this GitHub file, which we're going to actually use in our Vuex store. So that's the thing that we're going to populate through our entire application. So we can use that for both the table and the globe. And in order to create the globe, we'll use 3.js, so we have a single element. And then remember that life, uh, life cycle method, that mounted hook? We're going to pass the, te the texture of that globe into this init globe that I've created, and then we've got our globe. And not that you'd want to do this, but because Vue and 3.js play so nicely together, we can easily update the appearance of the globe in one line of code. So here we have an icosahedron. Don't do that. I don't know why. I'm, I'm just messing around. Um, <laughs> you can create any myriad of data visualizations with this um, manner. And Vue does the heavy lifting for a lot of that filtering of the table and creating this globe. 
view makes it extraordinarily simple to create complex and beautiful interactions that feel seamless for our users. We can connect states and reduce cognitive load for things that are changing in our application with ease. And I'd like to say on a personal note that sometimes building and maintaining large-scale applications for our users can start to burn you out, especially with high product deadlines. Um, this happened to me, and by working with something like animations that gives us such a dopamine rush for both us and our users, I started to stave off burnout and remember why I love working on the web so damn much. Thank you. <laughs>